And we got into a conversation. He was delighted to learn that animation wasn't this art form where you had to draw these carefully sculpted little detailed lines that you can be loose and rough while you were trying to discover the life force on a two-dimensional page. He was delighted to hear that. And I think that conversation with me being a young novice animator really inspired him and encouraged him to take it to the next level. Well, we are absolutely thrilled to have John Pomeroy back on the podcast. We are going to be talking with him about his cast of all-star instructors that he has on Pomeroy Art Academy. He has released a series, a special series of guest instructors on his site. And so we wanted to get with John and talk to him about some of the stories, some of the memories that he has with these different people so that you guys can get a little bit of a taste of his experience with them. So without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it. So John, you overlapped with Glenn Keane when you guys worked on Pocahontas and you guys were both really key animators for that, supervising animators for that project. So could you give us like when, when you guys get together, what are maybe like the top three memories you guys like to reminisce about from that production? Wow, Mark. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for having me on your podcast again. It's been great. Um, Glenn and I go back a long way. Uh, Glenn and I actually go back to even the days before he was at Disney. And um, this is uh, 1973, 1974. I had already advanced from being a trainee in the Disney animation trainee program in April or May of 73, they advanced me from a trainee to an actual animator working on my first production ever, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. And my supervising animator at the time was Frank Thomas. Mm -hmm. Frank Thomas is a member of that kind of that elite group that they call the Nine Old Men. And as anybody knows, this, uh, this was a powerhouse to be under his supervision at that time. Uh, God was watching over me and he was like, numbering my steps and negotiating me through, you know, uh, Disney studios and to be aligned with such a great talent as that was, was godly. And, um, but it was also a baptism of fire. And I, I remember, you know, Frank mentoring me in my scenes and, you know, instructing me. And I guess I must have done a good job because I got promoted once again uh, after the production and uh, I would visit Frank in his room and he and Wooly Reiterman, who was the director, one of the directors of uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 and the Rescuers, of which I was promoted onto, they asked me to be a part of the uh, review board, uh, which was made up of Ollie Johnston, Wooly, Frank Thomas, Mel Gibson, um, Oh boy, Don Bluth and myself, we were asked to go to CalArts in 1973 and 74 to review the work of the latest collection of animators that were now graduating. They had put together their reels as a portfolio and we were going to their screening room to take a look at what they had done. One of the participants in this was a very young Glenn Keane. Wow. And Glenn um, had a rough test, I don't know, what it was, I can't remember, but I remember our conversation with him and he recollects this usually when he gives his little animation testimony, he tells about the time we first met at Cal Arts. And we got into a conversation. He was delighted to learn that animation wasn't this art form where you had to draw these carefully sculpted little detailed lines that you can be loose and rough while you were trying to discover the life force on a two-dimensional page. He was delighted to hear that. And I think that conversation with me being a young novice animator really inspired him and encouraged him to take it to the next level. And I think it was just a few months later, he was actually hired as a trainee and went through the same trainee program that I did. And at the very, at, towards the end of production on Rescuers, he was brought onto the unit that I was in. I was working as an animator who was being supervised by, um, Ollie Johnston on the character of Penny. So there was a, a you know, about a hundred feet of animation that Glenn was able to do at the end of that production on the character of Penny. And uh, we got to know each other. There was a, before he actually received his first uh, animated scene, there was a moment of about a month or two months where he was actually my assistant. He was actually in between. Like, 
<laughs> they weren't great in between. <laughs> <laughs> And, but you know what? He was a fast learner. He was passionate. His heart was in it and he was learning. And by the time he started to get some understanding about what an in-between was and how to capture it on paper, he was promoted on to being an animator and receiving his first production scenes on Penny. So that's one of the things we have as our background. Mm -hmm. And Glenn was always, you know, his style of animation, I guess, um, Charles Solomon, who's written many books on the subject of animation, he put it this way. Glenn Keane, if he were a dancer, is Gene Kelly, and you, John, are Fred Astaire. So he is very athletic, very outgoing, very passionate. Uh, he gets a huge piece of block of graphite in his hand and watch him go. He just lathers the paper with tons of graphite and strokes. Me, I'm a little more delicate and refined. But we have our passion is expressed that way. And we joke about it. Um, when we left Disney Studios in 1979, Don Bluth, myself, and Gary Goldman, I said, you know, farewell to Disney and, you know, everybody there. So there was a long period of time where I didn't get to see Glenn or interface with him. And um, after, I think it was uh, around 1992, I returned back to Disney and the production they wanted me to work on was on Pocahontas doing Captain John Smith. So once again, we were partnered together uh, on the same production. It was wonderful. And by this time, he had a long record of successes where he was the animator of Ariel, where he's the animator of The Beast and Beauty and the Beast. And now he was the animator in charge of uh, Pocahontas, the title character. And so working with him was just terrific and they gave us rooms next to each other one of the things that was interesting Pocahontas um, you know was a it was a very real depiction of human characters there wasn't a lot of latitude with trying to be zany or funny or whatever it was a very uh, structured uh, assignment and we were on that for about two and a half years we had large crews of about 14 15 animators apiece that we have to supervise their animation. And um, one of the things that we can remember is from nine to five, we would be supervising other people's work. They'd be a line out each of our doors with animators work in hand for us to go over their drawings, review their footages, approve or critique or add to what they've already done. That would take an entire day. And finally around five or six o'clock, we get to do our own work. And many times during the course of the day, you'd have a maybe a little gap of about 10 minutes where you'd actually be able to work on your, your own scene for a moment. And then you get the knock on the door and somebody would have to come in. Glenn and I would equate this to being a pearl diver and having to dive deep and find the oyster with a pearl in it. And just as you were about ready to, to open it, someone would tear, tug on your airline and you'd have to go up to the surface and answer a question. So every time we greet each other, it was diving buddy. Oh. He was my diving buddy. I'm his diving buddy back and forth. The diving buddy uh, idea came about because of the huge load we'd have to carry. And those interruptions that would happen at a miraculous time where you get an idea and you want to put it down and boom, you'd have to look at somebody else's work. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and we've kept in touch. I've worked with him briefly for about a month on um, Over the Moon. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of his more recent productions and we keep in touch and when i approached him about being one of the guest instructors on pomeroy art academy he jumped for it i mean he was so gracious and so kind and glenn is interesting too because during the um during the latter part of pocahontas into he went on to tarzan i went on to fantasia 2000 and on to atlantis lost empire he began between my wife and him praying for me because I was a non-believer. And I got to say between my wife, Cammy, Glenn Keane, and another dear animator, Ron Husband, these three people got me into the kingdom and I accepted Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior in 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember when I first got to Disney, Glenn would always be having his Bible in his lap. He, didn't, he asked me, he would invite me, would you like to sit down and read scripture with me? No, 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 I'm not interested in that. <laughs> and so, you know, his, his um, 
influence in my life has been uh, nothing short of godly. So I have a, a deep yeah. affection for that for that guy. And yeah. uh, I hope we get to work together again. I know that the this uh, this lesson that he has provided in Pomeroy Art Academy is a great insight as to his approach to animation because there are a lot of artists that love that style to be rough and dirty and impulsive on paper to get that life force working to provide an, a, a terrific performance on screen. And, and I know it's, it's, it's amazing what we were able to capture on screen, not just as a lesson, but as a animation legacy yeah. for a historical record of his approach uh, to animation. Man. I think we could listen to you tell these stories uh, for hours. <laughs> yeah. No, I have to be honest. It's just wonderful. And I was going to ask you next, because I remember the last time you came on the podcast, you talked about Ron Husband being a big yeah. Yeah. impact on your life, not only animation wise, but just, just as a person and as a believer. But I wanted to know specifically when you and Ron worked on Atlantis together, do you have any yeah. stories that come to mind? Um, Cause I know Ron is another one of your instructors here in this special all-star course. Yeah. Ron uh, goes back as far as almost as Glenn. Uh, Ron came on to the trainee program, either 74 or 75. And uh, if there was an example of tenacious or tenacity in drawing, it's him. And he wasn't a, uh, a real strong draftsman when he first started, but he had an enormous heart and passion for animation and uh, constantly praying, you know, over fellow animators and laying hands on the doors of every room. <laughs> and um, that passion just translated into this tenacity to sketch and he must have a room filled with sketchbooks that he has filled over the last 50 years of his career in animation. And it's through this sketching over and over that he got strong and educated and, and had this amazing prowess with the animation art form. And he's the first um, um, African-American animator at Disney to be promoted, to be given a supervisorial role. Hmm. So uh, he was part of my team animating uh, Captain John Smith on Pocahontas. He was one of my 14, 15 animators, very diligent, wonderful to work with, good team player. You can't ask for a better guy than Ron Husband. The role that he captured on paper was of Doc Sweet, an African-American medical officer on this expedition. And it was just, it dovetailed. It was so perfect for Ron. He brought his sense of humor. He brought his sense of caring and nurturing in this character. It was, it was terrific. Everything that he had learned in his, you know, career. And he was also one of the few that got the opportunity to work with uh, the nine old men. He was, I think, under Frank Thomas for a while. He might've worked a little bit with um, Ollie Johnston. So he got a taste of that direct line of experience on production. And uh, in Pomeroy Art Academy, I mean, I asked him to be one of the instructors and like Glenn, he, he, he jumped, jumped for the chance. Um, and his, um, his lesson is more geared, not so much with animation, but on sketching, the art of sketching. Uh, the, the ability that you have to cultivate through the repetition of this exercise to get to be a good drafts person, to be able to become a reporter with a pencil, to be able to capture an idea, a thought, an action, or an attitude quickly and accurately, and how that uh, informs your animation process. He's an awesome guy, and he's so dang understated. He's such a humble, hmm. humble guy. In a way, he reminds me of another one of our nine old men instructors that I had that I touched base with years ago. And I think Ron might have worked with him is John Lounsbury. John Lounsbury was um, this very, not timid, but he was a very soft-spoken, humble animator. Unfortunately, he passed away towards the end of uh, Rescuers. I think in the uh, mid seventies, we lost a great artist, but uh, very, very soft-spoken. And yet he, he would animate characters that were just titanic. He animated mm. 
Pony and Joe, the Italian restaurant owner and his cook from Lady and the Tramp, animated Colonel Hottie, animated King Louie, very vigorous, strong action, Captain, Captain Hook, you know, and Peter Pan. I mean, he had a, a storm going on inside that nobody was aware of until he touched pencil to paper. It was amazing. Ron is like that himself, and he has he has many more wonderful things to, I'm sure, do in in his career. Yeah. Well, speaking of underrated, can we talk a little bit about Mark Henn? Because he's oh, he's gosh, yes. got he's got like a filmography that's just incredible, oh. you know. And and like, can you talk about you know maybe when you first met him or what was it like working with him? Um, Mark, Mark came on board at Disney. We were like two ships passing in the night. So when we left, when I left with Don and Gary to start Don Bluth Productions, uh, a month or two later, Mark came on into the tra animation trainee program and, and was able to, I think this is the last half of the production of Fox and Hound. Uh, I guess he was promoted through the ranks uh, of the, um, animation program into full production. I'm not sure who he, who was his mentor. It might've been Frank and Ollie. Um, I know he appeared, there's a picture of him in the Frank and Ollie book, Illusions of Life. I got to meet him when I first started on Pocahontas. Um, Mark was basically picking up scenes uh, from Glenn on Pocahontas just to do while he was waiting for next assignment, which I think was going to be Mulan. <laughs> And um, I got to meet him, you know, he was standing in the doorway of my office. Glenn and I had offices right next to each other with an adjoining wall. And Mark came in and I got to meet him. And we, our common ground was history. We loved um, history, we loved the Civil War. I was a, uh, a historical painter. I loved doing, um, I did about six or seven painted covers for military history magazines. So we got in this conversation about the Civil War, Gettysburg, and you know he was into uh, reenactment. He had a gun collection, so did I. And so this common ground kind of bonded us. And uh, he came to a couple of my art shows. We never actually got a chance to work with each other. Uh, uh, when I went on to, uh, let's see, after, geez, when I was on Fantasia 2000, I think he was just finishing up Mulan. And then when I went on to Atlantis, The Lost Empire, I can't remember what production Mark went on to. He's kind of, um, he is a born teacher. He has totally different approach to animation than Glenn or myself. Uh, Mark is extremely methodical and he's broken down a system uh, for animating the very best scenes possible. He hmm. calls it speed, S-P-E-E-D. And it's about analyzing, capturing, executing, self-critiquing, and then finally finishing an animated scene. And it's a step-by-step -step approach that he's developed over the last 40 years for himself. And it's terrific. I mean, it's, it's, he's put, you can put it in a textbook and hand that over to the next generation of animators and they can learn a great deal from his approach. And uh, when we filmed him, uh, we did it at his uh, home studio, which is just decorated with mementos over the last 40 years of maquettes and drawings and, and pieces of artwork and little show pieces everywhere. It's a real delight for the eyes when you go in there into his uh, home studio. And he welcomed us there and we set up and we were actually capture him on our video doing his approach. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, speaking yeah. of someone else that you might not have necessarily worked with, but you have connections to, what, what made you ask Tony Bancroft to, add, to be part of the all-star lineup? Have you ever worked with him or what was the, what's the connection there with him? We, I, we've worked together on three different projects. Actually, yeah, we've worked together on a, a obscure little thing for Disney called um, Wild About Safety, which was this little safety film featuring Timon and Pumbaa on what to do when you're traveling and what not to do. He was kind of my supervisor director for that. I would submit the scenes and he would approve them. So we, we started working there. Um, another, we worked on a project called... Um, Paul Bunyan, uh, this was, oh, geez, 
10 or 12 years ago, uh, I was doing storyboards for him and he was approving and supervising my storyboard work. And then later on, he directed a feature called Animal Crackers, which um, he partnered with a dear friend of mine here in Nashville, Scott Saba. And uh, Scott had written this script that got bought and developed into a feature film. And he reached out to Tony to be the director. And so Tony and I worked together. I was doing storyboards for him for, geez, well over a year on Animal Crackers. And he, it's, it's good to work with people who are very fastidious and not picky, but know exactly what they want. And there are many times you would have me redo whole sections of my storyboard because it was some little thing that I might have been missing. And that's, that's how animation is, a very collaborative art form. You work arm in arm with the people that you're with and always towards the best result at the end. And Tony has been, you know, he's been great. He's now joined us here at Lipscomb University here in Nashville as kind of one of the heads of the animation department. And uh, he's always good to work with. He's always very generous with contacts and the way of, ways of doing things. And uh, because of his experience on Mulan as a fledgling director, he had a fresh recollection of all the things that he tripped over and all of the things that were solutions that we were able to get uh, in a video lesson of his approach to directing. And I think it's gonna help future directors. Very methodical placement of each of the steps that he learned on his way through the production of Mulan. That's so cool. Well, leaning more toward that, you know, maybe supervisor or, or um, director, producer, that kind of role, you have a, a a lesson from John Cantor, who is an attorney, right? Yeah. So why do you think it's important for animation students to have that lesson from an attorney? And what, what can they maybe expect from that? It, it's, it's just one of those things that I thought needed to happen. I don't know of too many, I don't know of any other tutorials or podcasts or anything that features legal aspects of animation. And it's a very, very important factor in building a company and building relationships and building a studio and building a production. What are the, what's the legal underpinnings of all of those components? Unless you have that in place, you're bound to fail. I know that Don Bluth, myself and Gary Goldman had very little knowledge of business and legal aspects when we started our own company. Uh, we were leaning on the business uh, uh, knowledge of our partners at that time, but we didn't have that, that knowledge directly. I think it would have uh, helped us a great deal. I think it, uh, John Cantor is an interesting person because we've had a long relationship of at least 40 years with him. Don, Gary, and myself hired him back in 1982 uh, as our legal counsel for Dragon's Lair. Hmm. And in the course of that, those four decades, he has been legal counsel through, I don't know how many dozens or hundreds of animation artists and negotiating their contracts, um, helping them with uh, copywriting and trademarking their franchises, their ideas, their IT, all of these things uh, are really important to have legal counsel on, good legal counsel. And the basic questions that John answers are things that a lot of fledgling directors and producers are gonna need. Um, the, the kids that I teach right now at Lipscomb will one day probably hire me as a story consultant, as a storyboard artist, someone who can give them advice as far as uh, character design or environments or viz dev or anything. I know that's a reoccurring thing. So I always try to pass this knowledge on to the young generation that I'm teaching because eventually they may hire me. <laughs> so it's a self-serving process, but I think <laughs> so, so few of them ha are beginning to understand the art of animation, but they don't understand yet the business of animation. What do they do when they come up with a idea or a concept? How do they protect that? How do they keep that safe? Um, how do they pitch that idea to another studio or a, a possible producer? These are questions that, that they need to know, uh, have answers to. So John provided a very, very um, easy to understand question and answer 
to a lot of those uh, problems that artists are going to be encountering as they navigate, you know, the studio system. And, you know, with, with animation right now, the entire world is one huge animation studio. I mean, I, I've been working via Zoom and off of my laptop for the last 13, 14 years. I, I can get in to see a director quicker online than I can if I were in the room next door. And so there's so much of an abundance of work available right now. It, 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 it begs for uh, an immediate um, um, attention to the legal aspects mm -hmm. of animation. And you may be dealing with a overseas company. Uh, if you're doing a, a film like Land with Over the Moon, how do, what are the legal aspects and ramifications of doing a movie that's being financed by Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong? Trying to understand the logistics of that really helps you and protects you too. So it doesn't become you know, something that burns you in the end. Hmm. So it, it's very valuable, very valuable. And it's like I said at the very beginning, um, I've seen very little of this kind of content available online. So I thought, I think this is something that is really needed. Speaking of valuable, um, Dan Hofstede's IMDb list, like the, the things that he's credited on is just incredible. But yeah. taking that, what? why did you want Dan to teach characters for this all-star um, for this all-star lineup. So tell us your decision about that and why you chose Dan to do it. it it's just, I mean, that's, that was his um, breeding ground that got him into uh, animation. And he tells the story about how he was influenced by his father, who was a caricaturist for years <laughs> at Disneyland and uh, in Hawaii, you know, had a caricature business that he was very successful at. And you know that became the genesis for his appetite for drawing, for posing, for generating you know attitudes and emotions in a single drawing. That was kind of the stepping stone for him to get involved in animation. He um, he came out of Cal Arts, was employed by a studio, and then eventually made his way to um, Don Bluth Productions while we were recruiting for the movie American Tale. We had just signed on and did a partnership deal with Amblin Universal and Steven Spielberg. And um, Dan Hofstede became one of our first recruits. Mm. And he worked under me. Um, he had some great um, animal sketches and action sketches that said that this guy, this young artist has an aptitude for movement and understanding acting and animation. So I started working with him on American Tale and he grew and grew and grew. He was extremely passionate and diligent in his learning. And uh, he's always been very generous in giving. I mean, he would give 100% always in his scenes and he would always take the criticism real, very well, you know, like myself, you know, when you bring somebody your work expecting to have praise and it turns out to be just the opposite, you know, you have to shrug your shoulders and accept it. And he would do that very graciously. Over the years, he's developed not only as a strong drafts person and supervising animator, but I think he's been supervising, uh, he had supervision, supervising roles in other big pictures, Monster House, and I think uh, Polar Express. And um, he's, he's an amazing talent. But I thought, being that he got his grounding in caricature, I think it's really wonderful to be able to use that as a lesson base on Pomeroy Art Academy. Because there's a lot of people out there that loves to do caricature. And he kind of boils it down to things that not only can make you a better caricaturist, but inform you know, the animation process as well. Animation itself is the art of caricature and exaggeration. So it seemed like a, a perfect likely lesson to have on our repertoire. Man, thank you so much, John. <laughs> this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I think I we've covered the basics. Yeah, stuff. we have. So thank you, you so know, I much. Wanna, I just want to express to your viewers too that, uh, you know, uh, PomeroyArtAcademy.com is a ongoing library that will continue to be building 
And, you know, we have, you know, the first 15 lessons on my basic approach to animation, which is what I teach at Lipscomb. We have the all-star collection. Coming up in the wings right now, we have a wonderful course that's taught by a animator by the name of Ben Rishi on his approach to Maya. It's kind of the introduction to CG animation. It's a seven lesson course that's gonna be wonderful for a lot of people that wanna get into CG, but don't know how. Mm. After that, we have a, a, a three course lesson on storyboarding. We have a three course lesson taught by a dear friend of mine, uh, Tim Allen, who we worked on uh, at Disney uh, Animation TV. We worked on Fancy Nancy and Sophia the First together. He's got a three course lesson on layout. So there's an ongoing stream of lessons that are coming down the runway for anybody who would love or would be interested and curious about pomeroyartacademy.com. What a treat to uh, collaborate with John Pomeroy on this special episode of the Creative Community Podcast. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram, John Pomeroy Art, P-O-M-E-R-O-Y. That's how you spell his last name. He has a link there to Pomeroy Art Academy, or you can go to pomeroyartacademy.com. But um, he's a wonderful storyteller, and he has such a rich connection to these people that he has partnered with in this academy. And we just, we are such big fans of the animation that John made uh, throughout his life, even like one of his more recent projects is one of our favorite Christmas movies. Now we've made two episodes about it. You can go listen to it. We're not going to belabor that, but uh, we just really appreciate John. And we wanted to let you guys know about this really great opportunity and hear from his own words, like why this opportunity is so special and so important. So once again, John Pomeroy art on Instagram, Pomeroy art academy.com. Go check that out. If you're interested in even just um, learning more about animation or finding out if that's something that is uh, something you'd like to explore with your talents and abilities. Cause I think if you listen to the stories he told, you go back and listen to this episode, it, it's not just drawing people or drawing backgrounds. Like there's so many different jobs in animation that each of these all-stars is teaching you about. You might be able to take the skills that you have already as a as a creative, as an artist, as a designer, and implement them into the animation world in a way that you didn't think possible before. It was absolutely fantastic to hear from John, hear those stories about those guys. I was getting inspired. I really want to take the Ron Husband sketching one and the caricature one and the legal one just to know how to protect my intellectual property. Like I was so, I was like, man, these sound so good. I was like, I got to keep painting, but I want to take these drawing courses. So um, I, I was just really grateful to John. If you want to follow us, you can follow us at Instagram at Destination Arete, A-R-E-T-E. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter by sending an email to destinationarate at gmail.com. You can do that. And uh, if you like this episode, or if you know of anyone in your life who is interested in animation, interested in getting into that industry, you can definitely feel free to share this episode with them just as a source of encouragement and just as a way to kind of hear some stories linking all the way back to the nine old men up through Glenn Keane and then John and now the people that he's training. And you could be one of those people. So we will... Be back in two weeks with another episode. See you then.